episode 82 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast takes off now. What's up, Avi Nation? My name is Justin Seams, and this is the Pilot the Pilot Ask Me Anything. One of my most prized possessions from my childhood when I was growing up was a handheld aviation radio for my grandpa. My grandpa flew in World War II, and he always told me how important communications was. Handheld radios haven't been as popular until Sporties came out with the PJ2 radio. Smart pilots always carry a handheld radio for backup, especially in an emergency when it's no time to be searching for an adapter or an instruction manual. That's why Sporties created the PJ2. The PJ2 is the only portable radio that can be connected to standard aviation headset plugs without using a special adapter. The simplicity of this radio makes it a pilot favorite. Just turn it on, type in a frequency, plug in your headset. That is it. The PJ2 features a large backlit screen, handy last frequency button, an independent volume and squelch knob so it's easy to use in flight. It runs on AA batteries, so it can be stored in your flight bag for months without worrying about a discharge battery. It can also be powered by USB-C cable. The PJ2 Com Radio is the ultimate backup for pilots, and it's only $199. For information, visit sporties.com slash P2P radio. That's sporties.com slash P number two P radio. What is going on, Aviation Nation, and welcome to this exclusive Ask Me Anything. I have not done one of these in a while, so I'm excited to answer some questions. I put out um, a questionnaire on Instagram. I put out a story asking you for questions that you have for me, and it's been great to read them. It's been great to go through them. I picked out a few of them, if not all of them. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all of them. It kind of depends on how this goes and how in depth I can get to every single question, but I don't think you guys want to hear me talk for the next two hours. So I might have shortened up. We'll see what we can do here. But um, before we get into the episode, I just want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for submitting these questions. It's very humbling and honoring that you all have these questions for me and are interested to see what I've been doing and kind of my story as well, which I do want to record my story. Probably going to have my wife do it. Hopefully we'll be able to do it sometime. She's a medical student, so it's kind of hard to coordinate those schedules. If you like the podcast, please leave us a review. You probably know by now that I'm trying to get the 400 reviews by the end of the year. Last time I checked, we're right around 370, so 30 more to go. I think we can do it. I'll need some help. Share this with your friends. Let them know about the podcast and send a review in. Also check out our website, www.pilotthepilothq.com. You can find all the links to our social medias there, and you can also find some shops and some other cool stuff there. So that's about it. So Avi Nation, without any further ado, here's my Ask Me Anything. Welcome, 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 Avi Nation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, get right into it. Uh, I have a list of questions here that you all asked me on Instagram, so let's see what you have. Number one, how do you go about taking extended time off of your company I don't know if you mean just vacation time or like personal time off. We do have a way to bid PTO days. I believe I have about 12 that I can use within a year. It's all based on seniority basing and based on seniority. So just because I want the PTO day doesn't mean I'll necessarily get it. I have used them before and I have not had any issues getting them at all. So I don't know exactly too much about that process, but that's what I know. Now, if you're talking about vacation, vacation at my company is actually really great. My first year, I only had seven days off. But if you work the seven and seven schedule, which I don't, I work a little bit of a crazier schedule. But anyways, you work the seven and seven schedule, seven days off turns in to be 21 days off. My second year to I believe my fifth year, maybe sixth year, I'm not really sure on the dates, I have two weeks off. And those two weeks turn into two 21 day vacations. So I have 42 days off. Now, once you're here for 10 years, I think maybe you get four weeks off. So that's four 21-day vacations that you can sprinkle out and you can bid. Now, it's all seniority base as well. So the more junior you are, your maybe four 21-day vacations are going to be all in the winter time or they're going to be all in the early spring. So you're not going to work for a while, but you have vacation. But essentially, when you're senior, you can take one 21-day vacation every quarter. And it's pretty crazy. It's pretty incredible. I don't really know much about other airlines or other aviation job vacations, but this one sounds pretty great. And I'm looking forward to having four 21 days off. Here's a good question. Does your company know about and support your social media? Yes, they know. I don't do anything to bring it to their attention. I feel like if I keep posting the stuff that I do and they are not brought to attention of what I'm posting, that means I'm probably doing something right. I don't post anything that I would think would get me in trouble. So I try to stay away from taking pictures in flight. I try to just be respectful about the tail number 
And if there's a passenger leg, like I'm never going to show the passengers, obviously, and I'm never going to show the the tail number when I'm on that. So I try to be pretty secretive about who I work for. Now it's not any secret whatsoever. Like if you know the paint scheme and if you know the company, it's pretty obvious who I fly for. I mean, there's only really one company that has a hundred latitudes. So that kind of helps you out there as well. But yes, they do know. They know about the podcast. Funny story is I was doing my interview and in the middle of my interview, we're doing a tour. We went through the SOC, which is our strategic operations. And I was just talking and we're being shown around and someone came up to me that I've never met before. And they're like, hey, are you Justin from the Pilot the Pilot podcast? It's like, oh my gosh, it's so great for you to be here. And we talked for two, three minutes. And then my interviewer was like, what is happening? Who are you? <laughs> so it was kind of funny, it kind of broke the ice. And I'm not saying it got me the job, but it definitely didn't hurt at all. Here's one. What is your craziest slash worst passenger experience? Now, I can't talk about anything that has happened or will happen at this company. I will say overall and pretty much every single time the passengers are great. I have not had any issues with any passengers. I've had great times with the passengers and I've enjoyed flying packs. But uh, when I was doing the freight stuff, the craziest thing I ever did was just to, to go pick up a dog. We um, Someone hired the PC-12 and get, granted, it was a freight PC-12. I mean, we had like the worst setup. We like stripped out all the insulation. Like it was not good setup for passenger trips. And we flew someone to go pick up a dog that they bought. And that dog ended up throwing up in the plane. It wasn't a crate, but just threw up all over the place in the plane because we're having to fly around crazy weather and had some turbulence. Here's a question. Should I come work for the same company you do, even if it would mean a moderate pay cut? Um, I don't want to say that you should. I really enjoy where I work. I think that it is all based on what you want to get out of a job. I've preached this before and I'll preach it again. Every job is different for every people. What works for me with a company I fly for might not work for someone else. I really like the ability that I can live anywhere I want. And I like the ability of working seven days and having seven days off. Granted, that's not the schedule I work right now, but that is an option in the future. There's also a schedule that's one farther down. So when my wife's a doctor and she's making all the money, I can just hang out and focus on podcasts and make pilot the pilot into what I want it to be. So I would say it's a great company to work for. I would highly consider it. The future is bright for here. We have a lot of airplanes. We have a lot of movement, not right now, but I mean, aviation is going to change a lot in the next 15, 20, 25 years. So I think I am the youngest pilot here. There might be a couple younger than me now, but when I was hired, I was definitely young. I was definitely the youngest. So there's definitely an opportunity for me to be in the global flying left sea all over the world in the next 20 years or so, which I mean, is something that I would like to do. It's an aspiration of mine. So I, I think it's a great place to work. I'm not going to say that you should come here, especially a moderate pay cut. And again, with money, it's all, it's all toss up. I mean, sometimes you get paid more money, but your life is going to suck a lot more because they expect more out of you for paying you that money. So you really got to do your own research when it comes to a job and just figure out what works for you because what works for someone might not work for someone else. If you could change something about your past career-wise, what would it be? Let's see. I, I mean, I would like to say I would like to change the first company that I worked for because it ended up with an engine failure on a mountain in West Virginia. But honestly, every experience that I've ever had has shaped me into the pilot that I am today. So I probably wouldn't change anything of that. And I think maybe it would be in my training. I always made excuses for why I shouldn't fly. And if I would have been able to get my private earlier, maybe get all my ratings done earlier, I could probably have been where I am now, maybe an extra year, maybe an extra year or two. So that's money that I could have missed out on. So I'd say it would be not to make excuses in my training and just try to fly as much as possible. Best thing about working where you work, I can live anywhere in the country. It is unbelievable. No commuting. You can tell them within seven days, hey, I want a base change. They will grant it. And you could essentially live in a new city every seven days of the year. It's crazy. It's amazing. And they fly me to the plane. So I'd say that's one of my favorite things. What made you want to work corporate instead of the airlines? So it's funny. I know I've said this before in the podcast. When I was growing up, I never really wanted to be a pilot. When I did decide to be a pilot, I wanted to follow my dad. I was like, all right, he's an airline pilot. So let me go ahead and go to the regionals. Let me do this. Let me go to the majors eventually if I was lucky enough. And as I just kept getting jobs and as I kept flying, I fell in love with general aviation. I fell in love with FBOs. I fell in love with the ramp. I fell in love with talking to the line guys and girls and getting fuel and kind of doing all that stuff. And I like just taking it slow and just being on the ramp and enjoying it all. I think that nothing beats a general aviation ramp. I mean, I have never flown airline world stuff, so I don't know. Maybe that is just equally as great. But where I am right now in my life, I just love the fact that I can 
live wherever I want and kind of do whatever I want. Do you have any suggestions for a low time commercial pilot? What survey and cargo jobs do you suggest? Uh, The route I went obviously was survey and cargo. I don't know if that's the best route. It's just what happened to work for me. When I had the engine failure, I knew that I wanted to get out of the aerial survey company, not as fast as I could, but the one, the best opportunity showed up. And I also knew that I wanted to, to diversify my resume a little bit. I didn't think that flying aerial survey and perfect weather conditions, I mean, we did fly in high winds, but in no IFR situations, I didn't think that would really make me competitive if I wanted to go to the airlines or go regional or maybe get corporate. So I sought out some great opportunities and I thought to myself, what's better than single pilot IFR time? So I would personally try to figure out what your goals are. What do you want to do as a career? Do you want to go airlines? If you want to go airlines, and maybe it's aerial survey to a regional. Maybe it's CFI aerial survey to a regional. If you're looking to go more corporate route and you're looking to maybe fly cargo, I don't know, you can do CFI. And then once you get 500 hours, pretty much any aerial survey company will hire you with 500 hours. They need to figure out again what job you want because you got to look at those minimums and you got to try to tick everything off. If you go to Plain Sense or you go to the company I went to and you're not getting any multi time and you have no multi time, then you're really kind of shooting yourself on the foot in the future. That's not a knock against Plain Sense. I'm sure they have, they actually have the PC24 now. So eventually you can get into the jet, build some jet time. So there's definitely some options out there, but just make sure what you want to do, you have that goal, have everything listed out of how many hours you need every kind of minimum that you need to get and craft a plan to get it. Whether that means you become a CFI and MEI until you get 500 hours of multi-time or until you get 25 hours of multi-time, whatever regionals require these days, the company I work for required 2,500 hours total time and 500 multi-time. So I got 500 multi-time at the aerial survey job I had. And as soon as I got that, I was out of the door. I was trying to find a better job with a better, better equipment and offered me some more experience. So Like I said, it's what works for you best at what works for your goals. So kind of just make a list and figure out how you can best get those goals as fast as possible. Is it possible to be hired for an on-demand operation with having less than 500 hours total time? I don't know this because it's been a while since I've had less than 500 hours. I will say when I was getting hired that you couldn't get hired without a thousand hours. I think that's dropped now to 500 hours. I think 500 hours is a huge number. Once you hit 500 hours, I think you're pretty much open for any SIC job that there is, whether it's in a jet, King Air, a Pilatus, any kind of those companies. So I really think you need 500 hours. If I'm wrong, someone let me know, but I'm pretty sure you should shoot for 500 hours and then you might be able to get that job. What was your most challenging rating to get? I would say my IFR rating. I just moved back to Charlotte. It was a new flight school. I didn't know my instructor. I just came off of having one of my favorite instructors I've ever had who really pushed me to get my private and really kind of woke me up that I needed to study a little bit more. So I would say getting my instrument rating, I actually failed my instrument rating. So it's not something I'm very proud of. And I've talked about it a little bit before, but I was just rushing. I was rushing as hard as I could. I didn't fully understand every single concept. So I would definitely set my instrument rating. What do you recommend student pilots do to help get through the written exam? I would highly recommend for your private pilot to actually study for it, to to know everything you can possibly know, take that test, pass the written test, then pass your practical. For instrument and beyond, I use Shepard Air. It was probably the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. It is kind of the cheap way out. Now you do pay for it, so it's not actually cheap, but you are just memorizing a bank of questions. So essentially what Shepard Air is, is they have people take tests, they know the questions, they send them in. If there's ever a new question, someone sends it in, you get your Shepard Air free, I believe, something like that. But it essentially, you memorize the questions. I mean, it's as simple as if this question asks for anything with figure B, the answer is always C. If it asks for figure B, but there's like an upside down triangle in the third paragraph on the left, then the answer is A. So it literally knows every single question, has a bank of everything and every possible way they can ask it but it honestly gets you to pass the test, which that's all you really need to do for the written. Now, when I say this, you have to know your material. So just because you can memorize stuff for the written test doesn't mean you're going to be memorize it for your actual practical and your oral. You're going to get asked some really hard questions. So it's important to have that knowledge to back it up. That's where you get courses with angle of attack. You can get courses at Sporties. Now we ran an ad through Sporties last week about pilot to pilot course with sporties about their learn to fly. It's learn. It's uh, what is it? Sporties.com slash P2P course. That's sporties.com slash P number two P course. 
They have some great courses there. You can learn some great valuable information. They help you with everything. They help you prepare for your written, your oral, and your practical. So go check them out. It's definitely worth it. Why doesn't the B2 bomber have a vertical stab or a rudder? I have no idea. I, <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't know that and I have no idea. I'm guessing the aliens helped us and gave us some crazy technology. So let's go with that. Do I have eventual plans to go mainline? This is kind of the million dollar question and I wish I had an answer for you because then maybe I'd be able to sleep a little bit better at night. Here's the thing. I love my job. I love what I do. I love the plane I fly. I love the type of flying I do. I just don't love how long I am gone away from my wife. I wish I was home a little bit shorter, but at the same time, I'm here for a while. So if I work seven days, I'm home seven days, which at an airline is not necessarily true, but an airline, you might be able to get some good, you have much more schedule flexibility. Now, will I go mainline? I, I don't know. I would think about it if the opportunity popped up. I, like I said before, I love my job. I can see myself staying at my job forever, especially with the flexibility that we can live wherever we want. But you can make more money at a major airline. So we'll see when the time comes, I'll cross that bridge. Why did you forego CFI and regionals? I never wanted to be a CFI. I always thought about going regional. So the reason I didn't want to be a CFI is because I didn't think it was fair to my student. I was going to be in there just solely to build time and leave. I was not like Marlon where Marlon stayed to make sure his students were going to be in the best position possible. I know selfishly, I just would have been in it for the time. And I think I would have been doing a disservice to my students and to the future of aviation. So I realized that I recognized that and I looked for other jobs. Now I was still training for my CFI and I think I would have been a good CFI and I probably wouldn't have actually just been in it for the hours I probably would have cared about and actually liked it. But I was still trying to, to do everything actively to not do it. And in the middle of my CFI training, I got a call from a survey job and I essentially left immediately to go get paid to fly, which was amazing. Now the regionals, I kind of explained that in another answer. It was just kind of a gradual change in my life and in my career where I realized maybe the regionals wasn't the route I wanted to go. Now there's nothing against the regionals. The regionals is a fantastic job. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic way to build your time and to get you at a 121 major airline. It's probably the best way. And it has come a long, long way from when I talked to Kurt and when I talked to Kevin Casson about how they're sleeping on benches, shaving in the terminal and all this stuff. So the regional pilots now have it very, very, very good. All right, here's a question. What advice would you give someone in the early stages of part 141 school? I would tell you to make zero excuses for yourself. If you don't want to fly, if you don't think you can go fly, maybe you're feeling too tired, I highly challenge you to go fly. You are not as tired as you actually think. Now, there's a difference between that. I'm speaking from my own personal experiences where I thought maybe my workout with the football team is too hard and my legs are too tired. But this, I highly recommend you try to push through it. Go fly, get your ratings done as soon as possible. You got to kind of play the game in 141. I mean, there's so many boxes you have to check off. So I would highly recommend you do your research and what you need and what you're expected to do. Study beforehand and make sure you get it done as fast as possible. I'm looking into starting flying school in January. I'm six foot five, 315 pounds. Am I too big to fly or too old to fly? No and no. The fact that you're six foot five, 315 might limit you in the airplane that you can actually train in. A 152 is probably not going to work out. A 172 probably will work, but it's going to be very uncomfortable. I'm not six foot five, 315, so I don't know that for sure. And I don't know that to be a fact. I recommend you go to your flight school and find a flight school that has other options. Now, this might make flying a little bit more expensive for you. People fly 152s because they're cheaper. They don't fly because they like them more. So the bigger the airplane and the more comfortable the airplane that will fit you, the more expensive it's going to be. So it's kind of going to be a toss-up with what you want. If you can fit in a 172 and you can fly safely, then I highly recommend you do that. If you need a little bit more of a room, maybe in an aero or maybe you need a Cirrus or something like that, it's definitely going to cost you a little bit more. So no, you're not too old and you're not too big to fly. Laddie versus PC-12 flying. Um, Do you have any other way to ask that? Like takeoff, performance, anything else? I mean, Laddie beats the PC-12 in everything, in my opinion. I mean, the PC-12 is great. It's probably the best single-engine turboprop that there is in the market, but two jet engines, you just can't, it just can't be beat, especially with the performance that Laddie has. Now, Laddie's slow, but the PC-12 is slow as well. Um, So I'm gonna have to go with Laddie 100%. Plus, it's the first time I've ever been in a plane that has working heat and working air conditioning. And it's amazing. So laddie all the way. 
how long do you want to stay at your current job? Man, you guys are really worried about my job. Uh, <laughs> I want to stay here forever, honestly. I can see myself staying here forever. Kind of talked about with a mainline major job. If the right opportunity comes and I know where we're going to live for the rest of our life, maybe then. But I would just be worried about the flying. I just I like the uncontrolled chaos of the place that I'm at right now. And I don't mean that with my operations. I mean that with my day. We really don't know where we're going. Every single day is new. Every brief changes our whole day. I've had five, six, ten brief changes. One time I'm going to Bermuda, then we're going to LA, then we're going to Alaska. Like you go anywhere. And I just really enjoy that. Biggest advice to someone that is building their hours while not pursuing the CFI path. I hope I didn't start this. I hope I didn't put in people's minds that you shouldn't be a CFI. Being a CFI is a great way to build your time and probably the best time. I think I've said this before, not sure, but one of my good friends at Ohio State, I kind of tracked our path. He went the CFI route. I went the aerial survey route and freight route. And we got our time at the exact same time. Maybe one month he got more, maybe one month I beat him. But at the end of the day, it still took us the same amount of time to get the jobs that we wanted to get. So I, I don't want people to think that you shouldn't become a CFI. It's probably the best route to go when you're building your time. Just for me, it didn't work out that way. But if you are not looking to be a CFI, you should probably look at aerial survey from the beginning. They hire at the lowest amount of time. They'll hire with people just with a fresh commercial ticket. You usually need your multi-engine as well. And then once you get to 500 hours, you can kind of switch over to a, um, a freight operator or a Cape Air or a Plain Sense. But I guess I didn't really fully answer that question. You said, what's the biggest advice to build your hours? I would say to never think you're too good for a job. When I first got hired by the aerial survey company, my first job there was to sweep up the floor of the hangar. So I know times have changed and I know you want to get that airline money or whatever money it is, but be humble, be ready to accept the lowest on the totem pole and just do your job with a smile. I mean, at the end of the day, we're flying planes, we're doing something pretty crazy. So just be humble and uh, be willing to fly and do whatever it takes to get that time safely, of course. What's a piece of advice you wish you had before your accident? It's a good, good question. And I don't know if I have an answer it right off the top of my head. I will say that after the accident, I was terrified of flying. I was afraid of flying. And the best advice given to me was to get back in the plane as fast as possible. And there were times when I was flying and I would legit feel uncomfortable in certain situations. But the only time for me, the only way for me to get over that was by getting back in the airplane and forcing myself to get over those feelings. I mean, there's times I was on uh, an airline home the day after the accident and they pulled the power back to idle and I immediately just had like PTSD back to when the engine quit. So there was a lot of struggles with that, but I just had to get back in the plane. I had to force myself to get back into the plane and kind of fall back in love with aviation and fall back in love with flying. <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions. What's your biggest pet peeve about the pilot community in a social media sense? This might not be what people think I was going to say. I kind of have to. Number one is very trivial. It is. I can't stand, it's not necessarily aviation. If you put that you're a public figure and you have a hundred followers, you're not a public figure. <laughs> I mean, in very extreme circumstances, you might be a public figure, but the chances are if you only have a hundred followers, you're not a public figure. So just take it off your profile. But other than that, an actual pet peeve is the fakeness sometimes, you know, when you're just showing all the good stuff. I think that social media should be here to be real. It's not a bragging competition. It's just to show our love of aviation. So I would probably say that. What's the performance like in Laddie when you're light? It's unbelievable. This plane is slow as slow can be when you're cruising at four zero zero. But when you're getting ready to take off, this thing's got some power and it will climb. So there's times where we've taken off and distances I didn't even think were possible in a jet with people, without people. So you can do some pretty incredible things. Has better single engine performance than the, La than the uh, Pilatus for sure. Would you change anything about your past training or jobs? Uh, I kind of answered this before. I would change some about my training. I would probably put in a little bit more effort to, to go to every single training flight and fly as much as possible to get my ratings done as soon as possible. What's my least favorite airport to fly into? Oh man, uh, I ask this question to people all the time. And I don't know how I, have, I actually have an answer. I had one of my worst landings I've ever had in my life at Naples. So for a while, I didn't like Naples. That was just a personal reason. I have nothing against Naples whatsoever. It's just the conditions and I was newer to the plane and it wasn't the latitude. It was in, I forget what plane. I think it might've been in a caravan or something, but I just did not enjoy going to Naples and it kind of took some time to shake that mental barrier off of me. 
Uh, least favorite airport. I would say right now my least favorite airports are some of the smaller deltas or Charlies when they suddenly get busy and they don't seem to know how to how to work that airspace. So I like going to the busier airspaces where it's just like a a boom, 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 like a Charlotte, like a JFK, like an Orlando, where it's like, all right, cool. They know exactly what they're doing. They put you in the exact spot and they expect you to do exactly what they tell them, what they tell you to do, and then everything works as planned. It's amazing and it's beautiful. What's the best way to get into corporate aviation? Um, Corporate aviation, I think, is a lot about who you know. So it goes back to what I was talking about with the mentors. Last podcast was with professional pilots of tomorrow. If you need a mentor, go check them out. Check out their Instagram. Check out their website. Get a mentor. The best way in a corporate aviation is by knowing people. You can either do it with a mentor, work in the line to find a King Air job, and just kind of work your way up. What's my long-term career goal? Um, like I said before, I really like where I'm flying. I like flying business jets. I like flying private. So I think my long-term goal is to stay here. Pilot to pilot-wise is... I want it to be the biggest media company in aviation. Now, I mean, that's a very extreme goal and I'm not sure how I'm going to get there, but that is one of my goals. I want to turn pilot to pilot into something much bigger than just my podcast and this podcast, whether it's multiple podcasts, whether it's YouTube channels, whether it's just, I just want to change the media game in aviation. And I think that we'll be able to do it. We need some help, but I think we'll be able to do it. You like ballpark Franks or bratwurst? Bratwurst, 100%, not even close. Besides working on the podcast, what do you do during your off time? I'll be honest, I'm pretty boring. I work on this podcast all the time. As soon as I land, maybe I'll take an hour or a day off of just relaxing, catching up on the TV and just doing mindless stuff. But other than that, it's all podcasts. It's all trying to get guests. It's all trying to build the brand. It's all trying to get advertisements and sponsors to help build the podcast so we can create all the content that I want to create. I want to switch over to YouTube. I want to switch over to maybe a blog, a job board, just a bunch of stuff to help aviation. I, I kind of see it as all the problems and struggles I had when I was going through aviation. I want to try to put a way to fix that and make it better for future pilots. And I want to help solve the pilot shortage. So got a lot of plans and I don't have much off time to do it. What's the furthest airport you've been to in the US? How about international travel? Uh, personally, I've been all the way to Shanghai. My sister lived in Shanghai, so we flew business class. Thank you, standby. My dad flies for American. Flew business class all the way to Shanghai and back. So that's probably the farthest I've ever been. Been to Hawaii. Me flying. Been to uh, Barbados. That's probably the farthest south I've been. Um, Been deep into Mexico with a PC-12. We've gone to Bermuda. Gone pretty far, as far east as you can go in Canada to St. John's. Been pretty much everywhere that you can possibly be in kind of North America and as close to South America as you can get by going to the islands. But I want to do some more international flying. That's what I said earlier. Being on the global or the Gulf Stream of my company is one of my goals. Being able to fly all over the world would be just probably the coolest thing. All right, last question. You guys have survived. Hopefully you're still listening to this by now. My voice hasn't bored you to death. What's your favorite and least favorite thing about flying corporate? My favorite thing about flying corporate, what I said earlier, I can literally live anywhere I want in the entire country and my company will buy me a ticket to go to the airplane. My least favorite thing about flying corporate is I'm gone for a very long time. I'm gone for eight days at a time and I come home with only about five days off and eight days is a little bit too much for me for where I'm at in my life, but the money's good, the flying's good and Laddie's amazing. So that's probably my two least, that's my least and my favorite thing about corporate aviation. Aviation, that is a wrap of the Ask Me Anything. Thank you for asking those questions. We had about 32 questions, I believe. I want to do this again, maybe a monthly Ask Me Anything. You guys let me know. Send me more questions. I'd love to ask them. I'm trying to set up a Patreon only Ask Me Anything. So if you're interested in being a Patreon member and asking me specific questions about Laddie or my career, you know, just let me know. Also, just let me know what you think about the podcast. You can do that either by leaving a review or sending me an email. I love reading your emails. I'm not the best at responding to emails. I'll go ahead and say it right now. Kind of goes back to the, what do you do in your spare time? It's literally trying to create content and I'm not the best at sending emails, but I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better. I'm always trying to find ways to improve myself and to improve this podcast. So let me know. Let me know what you think and let me know who you would like to have on this podcast. I would love to tell everyone's story. It's obviously probably not possible, but I'm going to try my hardest. So I hope you enjoyed this Ask Me Anything. I have had fun talking with you. It's uh, not very often I just sit here in front of a microphone and talk for 30 minutes. So hope you enjoy it. Hope you got your questions answered and let me know what other questions you have. So Aviation, 
Thank you guys for listening and happy flying.